Hi, in this video we're going to be talking about section 14.3, all about partial derivatives. Finally we've gotten to the spot where this section has anything to do with the chapter title. Now as much as I make fun of that, it is of course necessary to understand what a multivariable function is, which is 14.1, and it's necessary to understand how we're going to do a limit in um, higher dimensions in 3D space and 4D space and above, right? When we have two inputs, we want to understand what the limit is. When we have three inputs, we want to understand what a limit is before we start doing calculus with the higher dimension functions. So if we go back to 2D land, f prime of x was the limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. And we were thinking of h as a tiny change or perturbation of the x dimension. And we would see how that affected the slope. How does that change in x affect the change in y? That's a slope. And by taking the limit as we went to 0, that gave us a derivative, a infinitesimally small slope, right? The slope at a point is another way of talking about this. And what does that derivative represent? Let's just draw it out. It's going to be the slope of a function at a specific point. Okay, there's my not perfect drawing. But that's what we represent. We have the slope of this line at that point. That's what we're trying to find. And we use this limit to do that. So how about in higher dimensions? f of x, y is no longer a curve. f of x, y, and again, we can add more and more stuff to this, but this is a surface. OK, it's a surface with both length and breadth and height, it exists in 3D space. So how are we going to find the tangent line to a surface at a point, right? So we can have our 3D sheet, right? We can have a 3D sheet and we can look at a specific point, but now there's this tangent line to the surface there's this tangent line to the surface. There's this tangent line to the surface. And if you look at any object that you have near you while you're watching this video, if you pick a spot on the surface of that object, there's infinitely many tangent lines you can draw to a specific spot. So we have infinitely many tangent lines. Infinitely many tangent lines. Now, in fact, there's one for every, I'll put direction in quotes, and I'm going to underline it. That's definitely something worth thinking about. There's one for every direction that we could approach that point. If you think about walking up this surface, just like we were talking about in the limits, if you think about walking up the surface, that's one way to approach that point. You walked up along the surface along a certain direction or orientation. And that's too much for us, uh, quite frankly. We'd rather make sure we can define the direction first, and then we can re resurrect the idea of a derivative. So. Um, to talk about derivatives, derivatives, we pick a direction first. And again, we're still using that word direction, a little wishy-washy here, right? In section 14.5, no, 14.6, we'll end up talking about directional derivatives in general. We'll talk about the derivative in any direction you want. 
Um, but for now, we focus on an X direction and a Y direction. If you're saying, well, why do we start off talking about the limits? One of the reasons this is the first thing you would study, and if you were inventing this subject on your own, it's probably something you would come up with eventually. Like if we're supposed to be doing a limit definition like that, we could say in the X direction, well, the derivative would be, I'm gonna skip out on the notation for now, but the derivative would be a limit. We're gonna make a small change as we go to zero. I'm gonna add that change only to the X component and leave the Y component alone. This is what we would mean by the derivative with respect to X. Now, again, the limit notation is not usually what we think about. So I want to describe what this notation is forcing us to do. We want to notice Y is not changing. And what do we call things that are not changing? Y is treated like a constant. If we're treating y like a constant, then we're going to have a picture like this. What does that do? Well, if I have a 3D space, and I have a surface floating there in 3D space. And we might have a point somewhere up here. And if we want to understand what's going on with this surface in 3D space, specifically its tangent line in the X direction, we can chop off a slice through the Y coordinate we're in. And if I focus my attention on the Y plane that's parallel, that contains that Y coordinate, we can chop and find that intersection of the plane and the surface. And that gives me a curve in this plane. Okay, so holding Y constant we have y equal a number. Like you can picture y equal 3. It's a plane parallel to the xz plane. And it makes a curve. in 3D space, along surface, along the surface, and in the plane, in the plane, y equals 3 in this case. 3 is just an example, obviously it doesn't have to be 3, but this is what it means to fix y to be a constant. If we think of y just as being a constant, then the x stuff is trapped. And it, sorry, then the y stuff's trapped in that frame, and the x stuff's allowed to move, and the z stuff's allowed to move, and now we have a curve in the x, z axis. So I'll draw that really quick. It would be like we have a curve that goes, just wanna get the perspective right. Okay, and that's what I'm seeing. And then now we're back to 2D calc and we can find the derivative like normal. That's what you should think when you see this. Now practice, this is going to be 
pretty easy to do. It's going to be a, a lot easier than what all this theory shows. But it, as always, I'm trying to show you the theory so you have an understanding of what's going on. That within that frame, we are getting a planar curve and you know how to do calculus on planar curves. That's what all of Calc 1, all of Calc AB was about. In a similar way, if I focus my attention on the y direction, I want to find the derivative in the y direction, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix the x stuff. And we're going to get a plane containing that x coordinate and intersect it. So in the x direction, sorry, in y direction, just to be clear, my derivative, you probably can predict this, still going to have a limit, still going to be h going to 0. But now we're going to manipulate the y coordinate holding the x constant. So x is constant. Uh, we get a plane parallel. Oops. We get a plane parallel to the yz plane, which is another planar curve. And if we draw it, it might look like this, which is a bit steeper, maybe. And we can see how these derivatives will be different. So if I have this derivative, if I focus my attention on the yz plane, we might see something like, again, steeper. But still having that same point. That point exists in all three dimensions, but once we restrict our attention to a constant plane, we can ignore the x. We're not thinking about how the x changes anymore because we've already highlighted the path on that surface where we're only traveling in one x direction. Picture it like this. For the x derivative, okay, it's opposites. For the x derivative, we're only going to allow us to change our latitude on the globe, our east-west direction. I'm only going to walk up this mountain going east to west. I'm never going to change my direction going north and south. And I'm just going to track my height over time. That's like an x derivative. I keep my north-south position, my y, constant. I keep my north-south position constant. And I'm just going to see how does my elevation change as I walk right along in the x direction, in the east-west direction. So to find the x derivative, we hold our y constant, which is like a north-south location, and I'm just going to walk up this mountain, my z, my surface, in the x direction, in the east-west direction. For the y derivative, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to hold the x constant, our east-west direction constant and just walk up the mountain in a north-south way. And we might cross the same points, but we probably would experience different slopes if you can picture that, okay? The hill I drew, the surface I drew is one such picture, even though it's not that pretty. In general, oops, bigger, holding one variable constant and taking the derivative is called partial differentiation and that should make sense this is kind of like, you know, we're only going to do half, half of the derivative. You don't want to think about it like that because there's, you know, this whole theory works for higher and higher dimensions. You're going to exclude all but one dimension 
and just see how that affects things. How does that affect the slope, the change in the output variable? It's going to be more and more appropriate to use that term. Okay, let's go over some notation for a surface f of x, y is equal to some z, right? We're outputting in the z-axis. Obviously, this notation will get a little bit different. If you have more variables, we'll have a different output variable, etc. X derivative. We're going to talk about, okay, it's supposed to be like a curly D. It's probably a backwards six, how I draw it. It's not really any other letter in the alphabet. Curly Z, curly F over curly DX, okay? We can still say it's partial. We can still say D. But we're going to write this this way, just the notation you have to get used to. So this is, again, holding Y constant. That's why Y is not in there. It gives the slope of the tangent line to the surface in the x direction. Okay, in the east-west direction. Okay, if we're thinking about latitude. We can also use the popular notation. It's not that, it's pretty similar. Partial Z, partial X. And then our Newton type notation, F subscript X. Okay, be very careful. Or Z subscript X. Now, the reason people don't like this is because that's really supposed to be something like this, right? It still has inputs. Don't ever mistake that little subscript X as the input of the function. All right. Notice how I still wrote it with X's and Y's inside as arguments. Just because we hold Y as constant and we take the derivative with respect to x doesn't mean x's are going away it doesn't mean y's are going to go away both could still affect the slope formula and the y derivatives you probably could write this paragraph on your own partial f partial y or df dy it's holding x constant It gives the slope of the tangent line to a surface in the y direction um, also use dz dy the other Leibniz type notation f sub y and z sub y okay the notation is something you have to get used to i'm going to try to alternate my notation in the video i probably prefer that just like we usually prefer f prime and y prime but there are some cases when this will truly be better okay so just make sure you understand all three notations all the different kinds of notations and be ready to rock and roll. Here we go. Let's actually do an example, right? Two X squared Y cubed minus three X squared Y plus two X squared plus three Y squared plus one. If what you've been saying so far is, boy, video is confusing, I don't like this, this will be pretty easy. Watch how this works. 
I'm going to take all the y's I see and treat them like every other constant. Focus with me on this for a second. 2y squared, 2x squared, can't even read. 2x squared, how do you take the derivative of 2x squared? You kind of ignore the 2, probably at this point. You bring this exponent down, you multiply, you get 4, and then you decrease the power by 1. What do I do with the constants? I basically ignore them. Okay, so when you see something like this, and if you get scared, guess what? We're going to ignore the 2, we're going to ignore the y cubed, if we're taking the derivative with respect to x. I'm going to ignore everything besides the x squared. So when I take the derivative with respect to x, I'm ignoring the 2, I'm ignoring the y cubed. We're going to bring the exponent down, 2 times 2. Is still 4, lower the power by 1, and stick the y cubed there still. Okay? What about this part? Same thing. I'm going to ignore that y. I'm going to ignore that y for now. I'm just going to bring the 2 down, 6x, and leave the y. That's what I mean when I'm saying treat y like a constant. I guess one other thing I could have said earlier is you might have been freaking out like, oh, there's product rule all over the place. No, that's not implicit anymore. Now the y is being treated like a constant. We're not done yet, sorry. Plus, okay, this has x's in it. We already talked about that guy, 4x. What's the derivative of 3y squared? Picture that said 3 times 5 squared. Would you do the derivative of that? Well, yes, but it's just going to be zero. You wouldn't use the power rule. It'd be just like the one. We're treating both of these like constants, like the one. And this is the derivative with respect to x. That's all there is to it. Let's do the derivative with respect to y, just for good measure. They never look the same, huh, the partial symbols? Okay, now what am I doing? Now I'm going to cover up all the constant stuff. I'm focusing on my y cubed. We're treating the x stuff as constant because I'm taking the derivative with respect to y. What do I do with y cubed? Well, me, I bring the 3 down, multiply it in front. So it'd be 6, leave all the constants alone. x is being treated like a constant. Ta-da! All right, the hard one. Cover up that stuff. Now we're thinking about taking the derivative of just y. What happens when I take the derivative of just y? The y kind of turns into 1, and 1 times all that garbage is 3x squared. 2x squared. With respect to y, this is just treated like a constant. So this guy's derivative is 0. All done. 3y squared. The interesting part, 6y plus 1 goes away. There you go, your first constant, sorry, your first partial derivatives. Um, I want to point out, right, ask yourself these questions. Does df dx only have x's in it? No. Does it only have y's in it? No. That's not what we're talking about when we say make things constant. We're saying the formula for the slopes, if we hold the y's constant, it's still affected by the y coordinate you picked. That's where these y's would come from. These are coming from the coordinate of the point you picked. Okay, that should still affect the slope it just happened that they were constant. They weren't getting changed by anything. For this one, does this formula for df dy only have y's in it? No. Only have x's in it? No. That has nothing to do with it. Please don't get it twisted. We did not use the product rule. The product will still come into play from time to time, but not here, right? Not today. f of x, y equals 
e to the x cosine y plus e to the y sine x. A cool little goofy function like this, right? We try to take the derivative with respect to x. Everything that has y in it is going to be treated like a constant. Don't just cover up the cosine y, right? This cosine has a constant inside. That's what you have to say to yourself. It's like we said cosine of 5 or cosine of pi. Not going to worry about it. What's the derivative of e to the x? e to the x. Keeping the cosine y. Over here, next one. Cover up that. It has y's in it. What's the derivative of sine x? Cosine x. So I'll keep the e to the y. Cosine x. Here's a good opportunity for you to check your understanding. Try the derivative with respect to y. Pause the video right now. Try it out. 3, 2, 1. All right. You should have gotten negative e to the x sine y plus e to the y sine x. Holding this constant, the derivative of cosine y is sine, negative sine. Holding this constant, the derivative of e to the y is e to the y. So if you've been worried about the product rule, you probably should have. It's going to come back with a, a splash now. But it's a lot more careful of a situation, okay? If that makes sense. So let's look at this function. x e to the x y squared. Now, when we look at this function, we might notice why we have to worry about the product rule. We have to worry about the product rule because if I think about how things are multiplying, I have a function of x with another function of x. Of course, this is for the x partial derivative. I'll change up notation, z with respect to x. So I'm going to do the first times the derivative of the second. So let's use this notation just to be clear. Plus the second times the derivative of the first. That's still the product rule. And that's correctly used here. If you're saying to yourself, well, why didn't we have to use it in the last problem? Do I have a, two functions of x multiplied anywhere? Here? Here? No. When the functions are multiplying, they're with different variables, so it's more like a constant times a function, like the scalar multiple rule. Here we have function of x times function of x. That's always been the product rule, always will be. Take a second to write this down. Try to give me the product rule to the best of your ability. It'll be x times what? Plus e to the x squared, xy squared times what? Okay. The exponential rule is keep everybody the same and then multiply by the derivative of the exponent, right? That's the inside, that's the chain rule component. What's the derivative of this with respect to x? Is this a product rule? No. This looks like it says x times a constant to me. So I'm just gonna take the derivative of the x and leave the constant alone, and that's what you should get. Over here is even easier. Just one, right? So if I clean this up, I get my partial derivative. My partial derivative is xy squared 
e to the xy squared plus e to the xy squared. Ta-da! How about z sub y? Z partial y. What's this going to be? When I look at this, do I see two functions of y multiplying with each other? No. Do I need the product rule? No. Is it wrong if you use the product rule? Not necessarily, but it is a waste of time. This is a situation where we'll just hold on to the constant on the outside and just take the derivative of what's left over next door. Okay, that's what's going on here. So in chain rule notation, it would be like this times we would keep e to the x, y squared the same, and then we're going to multiply by the derivative with respect to y of the exponent. And what's that going to be? x e to the x, y squared times 2xy. Ignoring this constant, bringing down the power, subtracting 1. Okay, you don't have to write it out in all these step by steps. I'm just trying to show you chain rule notation to make sure you understand we're multiplying by the derivative of the inside of the function, of the argument of the function. Just a couple more examples. f of x, y equals y to the x. Kind of confusing, right? What kind of function is this? When we're taking our derivative with respect to x, we're treating y like a constant. Okay, right? I'm just going to annotate this. y is a constant. So it's supposed to be like we have a to the x. If you think about that rule. How do we do the derivative of an exponential when the base is not e, right? When the base is not e. We would take a copy of it down, y to the x, times natural log of the base. Times the derivative of the exponent, which is just one in this case. Okay, if you don't remember that rule too well, I'll write it out. The normal derivative, the single derivative was a to the u natural log a times u prime, the chain rule, hook on component. Okay, so that looks weird. It looks like the function got a lot more complicated, but again, for f sub x is for the partial derivative with respect to x's perspective we're just talking about y is a constant that's all the partial derivative with respect to x knows okay for f sub y okay we're thinking x is a constant so picture we have x is our favorite number. So we have y to the a or y cubed. I guess I could have written that up here. This was like um, 3 to the x or a to the x. Those are the kinds of functions I'm talking about. That's what I mean by a, any constant. So if I had y cubed, what would I do? Oh, now we're in a power rule situation. So here's where in the power rule situation, we'd bring the power down, we'd subtract one from the power, and we'd multiply by the derivative of the inside, derivative of y, which is just one, because we're taking the derivative with respect to y. That's it. Easy peasy. Confusing one, but it's not that bad. Just want to go over one more part that gets tricky for people. 
just like a lot of people think you have to use the quotient rule for everything, what if we have something along the lines of z equals y squared plus 1 over x cubed minus x, right? Some people think you have to use the quotient rule for this. I want to point out that you don't. You don't. If we think about things correctly, partial z, partial x, we're keeping y constant. Put your favorite number in for y. So it looks like three squared plus one over x cubed minus x. That would be 10 over x cubed minus x. Some students do use the quotient rule every time they see a fraction. I would never use the quotient rule in that situation. I'd probably move the denominator up and use the power rule or the uh, chain rule, the power rule version of the chain rule. The chain rule version of the power rule, whatever. So I'm going to rewrite this as y squared plus 1 times x cubed minus x to the negative 1. That's a kind of nice move to do. And if we're looking at things that way, this is just a coefficient that I can ignore. So I'm going to bring the power down, multiply with the coefficient in front, leave the inside the same, whoops, the same, subtract one from the power, and multiply by the derivative of the inside. Is it beautiful? No. Is it easier than using the quotient rule? Sure is for me. If you use the quotient rule with respect to x, you have to remember the top is like 10, meaning the top is the derivative of a constant. So when you go to do um, d high, the derivative of the numerator, that's zero. So it'll work out to be a similar sort of thing, but this is the answer I would get. And maybe if you were feeling adventurous, you could rearrange it over x cubed minus x all squared. Okay, it's not pretty. I think it's faster than using the quotient rule. What about for partial y, partial x? We look like y squared plus 1 all over 3 cubed minus 3. Why am I plugging in 3? Because it doesn't matter. Let me just show you this example, 24. For that kind of thing, I wouldn't use the quotient rule either. The way I teach that in Calc 1 or Calc AB is if the numerator or the denominator is a constant, you don't want to use the quotient rule. It's overkill. Instead, I'd rewrite that as a coefficient, and I would take the derivative of what's next to it, right? Or just take the derivative of the top. I know some students say that. If you've already rewritten it like this, we're just taking the derivative of this part, right? And holding the front the same, the constant the same. Now, the only reason that worked is because there's only x's in the bottom and only y's in top. If there was y's in both, you'd need to use the quotient rule for the y. If there was x's in both, you'd need to use the quotient rule for x. But when it's a special circumstance and they're segregated, we can, we're good to go. So this would be a situation of like 2y and then keep the constant the same or 2y over x cubed minus x. Okay. In the next video for this section, we're going to go over lots of other stuff. We're going to go over when there's more than one variable. We're going to go over higher order derivatives, and we're going to go over implicit differentiation. There's still a lot to cover, so I'll see you in that video. Thanks for your attention. 
Bye.